Praise the Lord. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study in Jesus' name. And the blessings of God will pour upon every one of us in Jesus' name. Don't you like to stand up so we pray together. God bless your Father. We thank you for this hour in Jesus' name. Lord, we come before you because we know you are a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of compassion. And we come, Lord, under the shelter of your mighty arm. And Lord, we pray tonight, you bless your people in Jesus' name. All worry and anxiety take away from our lives in Jesus' name. Open our eyes to see that we're under your protection. And no evil can happen to any one of us. As long as we remain in the fold of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless your people tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We're looking at Matthew today, Matthew chapter 6. And we're starting a very important series from Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Please open your Bible with me. Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on, is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment, behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take his thought for the image? Consider the lilies of the, of the field, how they, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these, wherefore he God so close the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven. Shall he not much more close you? O ye of what? Of little faith. Worry and anxiety is because of our little faith. The Lord will increase our faith. And all the worry, all the anxiety, everything will clear away. As we begin to look at this, we'll see how the Lord started the passage. There is a word there in verse 25. It says, therefore. Whenever you see that word, therefore, you want to find out what it's there for. Why is it there? That is the things that follow. Why did Jesus say those things that he said after that, after that word, therefore? It's actually referring to what he had been teaching, what he had been saying. If you will look at verse 19, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth. It says, Where moth does corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, and where the thieves do not break through and steal. But where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Then it says, Therefore I say unto you, and then he goes on in verse, 20, in verse uh, 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore then I be single, sound, healthy, focused, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if then I be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters for either. He will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you. You see, it's coming from the background. And from what he had said before and what he had taught before, it says, because of what I said before, therefore I'm saying unto you, take no thought for your life. Now, it also says, I say unto you. You should be interested to find out the identification of that word you. I say unto you. 
By the way, who was he teaching then? Who was he referring to when he said, I say unto you, he's talking about the children of God. If you go back to verse 1, remember now I say unto you, we're trying to identify the people, the recipients of the message. When he said, you take heed that ye do not show arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your father which is in heaven. He's talking to the children of the father. And these children of the father, he addressed, he said, I say unto you, look at verse 4, that then as may be in secret, and thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee, reward you openly. He's talking about the people that have the faith in the Lord. They were children of God. Because they were children of God, he said, I say unto you. And then in verse 6, he's saying, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret, and thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Consistently, you can see that the Lord was talking to children of God. It's not just talking to every, every deacon. How is saying, don't worry. Sinners have a lot to worry about. They have a lot to worry about here in this time and then in the future, in eternity. Sinners have a lot to worry about, but the children of God, those who are born again, those who are children of the Heavenly Father, is the one, they are the ones this address. And it says, I say unto you, and then in verse 8, be not ye therefore like unto them. That is, don't be like the Gentiles. Don't be like the hypocrites. Then he says, for your father knows what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Because you are the church of God. And because your heavenly father knows what you have need of before you even ask. Therefore I say unto you. And then in verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. Those are the people, the people that have no grudge, no hatred, no bitterness. They're just in fellowship with the rest of the children of God. And he's saying to such people, you have no care, you have no anxiety, you have no worry. I say unto you, be not worried and be not anxious. In verse 15, but if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Look at verse 18. In verse 18 it says that you appear, thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now the whole chapter now is telling us the you, the people he was talking to when he said therefore I say unto you. What was he saying unto them? Look at verse 25 now. Take no thought for your life. Look at verse 31. Therefore take no thought. And look at verse 34. Therefore, take therefore no thought for the morrow. And when it says take no thought, it's trying to tell us what it means to live. To live a life of faith. A life of dependence upon the Lord. A life of confidence in the Lord. A life of no worry and no anxiety. When it says take no thought. Well, I will explain that later. But understand it now. It means don't be anxious. And it means don't be worried. It commands us not to worry. He commands us not to be anxious about our present need. And then about our future prospects as well. It tells us, number one, worry is unnecessary. Why is it unnecessary? Because we have a heavenly father who cares for us. It says, if you're a child of God, there is a father that is watching over you. And is watching over your soul, over your spirit, over your body, over your present, over your future. And he guards and protects you. And he says, therefore, worry is unnecessary. Number two, worry is unreasonable. Unreasonable, why? Because we cannot improve our lot by worrying, by being anxious. And you know the people that worry and worry and worry a lot. They don't improve anything. Their lives, their circumstances, their jobs, their families, nothing improves. 
because of worry and anxiety. Therefore, number two, worry is unreasonable. Number three, worry is unwise. Because it cannot stop whatever is going to happen. And that worry will paralyze anyone that is worrying, will par paralyze your faith, which has the power to change all situations and all things. If you're a child of God, then there is nothing to worry about. Maybe you are there, you, have, you want to find out what does it mean to be a child of God. Because I've read to you, it says your heavenly father, your heavenly father, your heavenly father cares for you. And you want to know, how do you become a child of the heavenly father? Because it's not everybody in the world that is uh, of the heavenly father. In fact, it's not everybody that acts religiously that is the child of the heavenly father have you ever noticed this was of jesus christ in john chapter 8 john chapter 8 i'm reading from verse 42 john chapter 8 verse why don't you go back to verse 41 you do the deeds of your father he was telling the religious people that went to synagogue every time and they went to the tabernacle every time and they were claiming to be the children of God. And we need to set that right at the very beginning. So that you understand. The people that Jesus spoke to when he said. Therefore I say unto you. Talking to the children of God. And I don't want you to deceive yourself. If you, are, if you don't know what it means to be a child of God. These people said in verse 41. And this be in verse, four, in verse 41. You do the deeds of your father. They said unto him. We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. We have one father, even God. You know, there might be people like that today because they confuse religion with righteousness. And because they think that religion is righteousness, they claim to be the children of God. Look at verse 44. Ye of your father, the devil. And the loss of your father, ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh, when, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Therefore we understand not everybody in the whole world belongs to God as children of God. How then do you become a child of God so that what we're studying, freedom from worry and anxiety, will become your privilege let's look at galatians chapter 3 verse 26 galatians chapter 3 we're looking at verse 26 and this makes it very clear how you become a child of god it says for ye are all the children of god by faith in christ jesus not by good works, not by infant baptism, or by confirmation, not by just going to church, not by bearing a Christian name, but you become children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You understand? The Bible says, So I've seen and come short of the glory of God. And now you come to the Lord. You say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. But I know Jesus died for me. And because he died for me, that's why I come to you on the basis of the sacrifice of Christ. And then as you believe on the Lord, your sins are forgiven. You become a child of God. Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9, we're looking at verse 8. Romans chapter 9, verse 8. That is, they which are the children of the flesh are not the children of God. They which are the children of the flesh, they are not the children of God. That means, uh, you know, if your father has been a Christian, your mother has been a Christian, and then you are given back to by Christians in court, that doesn't make you. A child of God. Because it says they that are of the flesh. They are not necessarily the children of God. But the children of promise are counted for the seed. When you take the promise of the Lord. Whosoever shall come on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you hold on to that promise. Then you are saved. You become a child of God. How would you know? When you become a child of God. You turn away from your sin. You repent completely. And then you pray to the Lord to forgive you. You believe that Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary. How would you know that the work has been done? Romans chapter 8 verse 16. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit of God bearing witness with your own spirit in your heart that now your sins are forgiven. You have the peace of God in you. And now being a child of God, there's nothing to worry about. God will take care of all your problems. He'll take care of all the challenges in your life. We come to Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewith that shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father, now that you are born again, your heavenly Father, now that the Spirit of God is bearing witness with your heart, that you are a child of God, your heavenly Father knows that ye have need of all these things. Worry causes and increases tormenting fear. Worry broods over what may never happen and creates unnecessary despair and depression. Worry makes a situation seem worse than they really are. Worry brings the pain of yesterday and borrows the problem on the burden of tomorrow. And that's all that to the concerns of today. And then you cannot carry that and become some bearable. Worry makes us live like a hopeless orphan without a heavenly father, without any promise of divine help and provision. That's why when you become a child of God, all you need now is just believe in God. Everything will be well. I said everything is well already. We're going to divide the message to three parts. Number one, Christ's command, forbidding worry and anxiety. Number two, common creatures, freedom from worry and anxiety. Number three, consistent confidence of faith, Without anxiety. Let's come to number one. Christ's command. Forbidding worry and anxiety. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 25. Therefore I say unto you. This is the savior talking to the saved. This is our king talking to his subjects. This is the very son of God talking to the children of God. Therefore, I say unto you, live a life of confidence, a life of faith, a life of no anxiety. Therefore, because as a father in heaven, therefore, because as a God, the creator and the redeemer of your life. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What you shall eat. Or what you shall drink. Not yet for your body. What you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat. And the body more than raiment. He repeats this again in verse 31. Therefore take no thought. It will be surprising then. If those people that were children of God before him. Peter, James, John, Matthew, the rest of them. If they began to get worried. It will be surprising because here is Christ himself, their Savior, their Lord, telling them that he knows the Father very much and the Father will never disappoint. The Father will never disappoint you. I said he will not disappoint you. It will be unfortunate then if any of them will become anxious, will become worried about anything. In verse 31, therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be close? And then in verse 34, take therefore no thought for tomorrow. Then it says, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the, unto the day is the evil thereof. It says, therefore take no thought. Now we need to find out what's the meaning of that. Take thought, take thought. Does it mean we shall never plan for the future? Does it mean we should never look at the future and say, this is the way to go and this is what I need to do? No, because Jesus Christ himself in another passage had told us, if you look at Luke, Luke chapter 14, in Luke chapter 14, we're reading from verse 20, uh, verse 28, for which of you intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, 
and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Did you see that? The Lord wants us to plan our lives. It's like, you know, if you go out of this Bible study now, and then uh, maybe you're about getting married, you've done the introduction already, and then you want to, you need to go and pay the dowry. And you want to go this coming Friday, just within a week. And then I met you on the way and I said, uh, uh, I, I learned you're going to pay the uh, bride price. Now, you said, yes, pastor. And I said, uh, how much do you have now? I will say, Pastor, I'm telling you, after the Bible study on Monday, I just felt that there's no point in trying to gather money together. Because now I'm not taking thought about anything. And uh, here we are, maybe it's on Wednesday, and you're going on Friday, and I say, but who are the people following you? Oh, you say when Friday comes, I'll know those people. I'm not planning for the future. Because the Bible says, take no thought. I'll have to sit down with you there to teach you all over again. Because you misunderstand the whole thing. Jesus said, plan. Plan your life. If you're going to get married, plan. How are you going to pay the dowry? What accommodation are you going to live in? And what are you going to use when you get there? And when the children begin to come, how do you take care of the children? That's planning. That's different from taking thought. I'll show you now in the Bible. Then let us look at verse 29. Let's happily. After he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Then he gives us a second illustration, a second example. A second parable to open up what he was saying about planning, planning your life. Then he says in verse 31, or oh, what king going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000 or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage. And desired conditions of peace. The Lord is saying very clearly we need to plan our lives. But what then does it mean? Take no thought. You know, it's, uh, that's the way the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, that's where they talked about worry and anxiety. That's how they talked about something that, you know, will so much disturb them. They become so concerned, they're not able to concentrate. That's worry. That's a different thing. And look at it in the Bible yourself. And look at 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. We're looking at what it means when it says, take no thought. 1 Samuel chapter 9. We're looking at verse 5. For Samuel chapter 9 verse 5. And when they were come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come and let us return. Lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. Take thought. Lest my father will not even bother anymore, will not be concerned anymore about the asses that are lost. And because now he can't find us and he doesn't know our whereabouts, he becomes worried, he becomes anxious, and he begins to take thought. Look at chapter 10 of 1 Samuel, verse 2. 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 2 When thou art departed from me today Then thou shalt find two men From by Rachel's sepulchre In the border of Benjamin at Zelzah And they will say unto thee The asses which thou wentest to seek are found And lo, thy father has left the care of the asses and sorrows for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? You see that has not become worried, has become anxious. So when the word of God says, Take no thought, what it means says, Don't be worried, don't be anxious that you are so much sorrowful in mind. You're so much concerned. You're so much full of care. And oppre it oppresses your mind. It does not allow you to sleep. That's what he's saying. That you will not have that kind of disposition of mind. Mark chapter 13 verse 11. Mark chapter 13 
The command of the Lord forbidding us to worry. Forbidding us saying, you must not be anxious. Just take all your cares, all your concerns, and lay everything upon the Lord. Mark chapter 13 verse 11. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what he shall speak. Neither do, neither do ye meditate, premeditate, for whatsoever shall be given to you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. It's saying that the Holy Ghost will be with you, and therefore any challenge you have, any difficulty you have, it will put the word in your mouth. Don't be so anxious and so worried. What am I going to say when he question me? The Lord is telling us, just come down. And then he'll give you the solution when the problem comes. I said he'll give you the solution when the problem comes. In Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 6, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. This is still the same commandment that the Lord is giving us through the mouth or through the pen of Paul the Apostle. Be not anxious, don't be worried. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, be careful for nothing. Be careful for nothing. That just means in nothing be anxious. In nothing be worried. Whatever is happening, whatever. In nothing. Don't allow yourself to become worried about your personal life. About your health. About your job. About the future. About getting married. About having children. In nothing be worried. In nothing, be anxious about the state of your children. Where is that boy now? Where is that girl now? What's happening to that child? God is taking care. He knows where the child is. He, know, he knows where the daughter is. He knows where your husband is. He knows where your wife is. Don't be anxious. He's saying, in nothing, be anxious. Be careful for nothing. You see, there are people that almost destroy themselves with anxiety. The wife goes to the market, there is a hold up. And the wife is not uh, back immediately. And now the man is worried and anxious. What's happening? Has this happened? Has this happened? Or the child goes to school. And the child does not come back in normal time. The child should come back. And then we're worried almost to death. And it says, be careful for nothing. That is, in anything at all, don't allow yourself to have that kind of depression or pressure in your mind that you're worried about everything. That you're always putting negative interpretation on whatever is happening in your life. And it goes on in that verse 6, but in everything, in everything, everything small or great, everything personal, everything domestic, everything in the family, everything about your job, everything about your health. If you're sick, God will heal you. If you're jobless, he'll provide for you. In everything, whatever the problem may be, just live a life without care, without worry, without anxiety. It says in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And then in verse 7, and the God of peace. Which, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest. Do you realize when people worry, when they are anxious, they are always thinking about things that are not true, things you cannot prove. Maybe this has happened, but it has not happened. Maybe that is happening, but it's not happening. Maybe they are thinking like this. Maybe they are acting like this. Whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are good report. If there be any virtue, or if, and if there be any praise, think on these things. No more worry, no more anxiety. The Lord will take care of our lives. First Peter chapter 5 verse 7. First Peter chapter 5 verse 7. Casting all your care upon him. Casting how many of our cares? And you know there are people that will cast their small, small cares on the Lord. But the big, big ones about how to get a job. The big ones, how to get a wife. 
the big ones how to have a husband the big ones how to be free from the enemy they carry that on themselves the small small cares they say god you can handle this and then they are worried to death they lose their sleep because of the big big ones I think you are wise. If you're going to worry at all, I think the small, small ones you should take care. And then the big ones that you know you cannot carry, all that one, you hand over to the Lord. You know, make yourself look like a Moses, for example. Here you have all these three million people. And then Moses said, Lord, where am I going to find water for these people? Do you know that God does not need an ocean? He does not need a sea to be able to give water to three million. Even if there's a dry rock, it can bring water for them. The big problems, hand that over to the Lord. That's how to be free from worry and anxiety. The ones you know you cannot solve. And the ones you know are bigger than you. It's like, you know, they, they were crying. How are we going to get food to eat if Moses was a bear that burden Moses said what do you say all the big big cares I, I take over I give to the Lord how he will give them I'll give them food you know we when we worry when we say are we going to give food to this you know where we're looking we're looking at the field we're looking at the ground so that we can get food for all these people but when that thing was handed over to God God did not bring the manna from the ground he brought it from the sky now you cannot do that. You cannot bring the food from the sky. But he can bring it from the sky. He can bring the water from the rock. Therefore all your cares. Especially the ones that you know. This is a problem I cannot solve. This is a big one. Hand it over to God. And God will take care of you. And now even the small small ones. We can give over to the Lord. The little headache and the little fever. And the little you know challenges. And you know there is no supper. There is no breakfast. How am I going to pay school fees? All the cares. We are going to hand everything over to the Lord. And I am telling you before this month runs out. You have a testimony already. Casting all your care, all, all. You know, the devil will try to bother your mind and make sure you to think high about this. You say, Satan, shut up. God is taking care of that. I about this one, Satan, I said, I'm not, I'm not in conversation with you. Shut up. God is taking care of that. What will you do if something happens? If it happens, God is watching. That reminds me of, you know, a little girl that just got born again, became a child of God and received Jesus into her heart. And somebody said, you know, the devil is going about as a running lion. And what if in the night, uh, the devil comes as a running lion and knocks at the door of the place where sleeping what will you do oh the little get said that's very simple i'll say jesus go and meet him at the door <laughs> casting all your cares upon the lord and when any challenge come just say jesus meet them at the door and then you stand behind the lord jesus christ and see jesus will knock out their head once again <laughs> casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you it's not that he will care for you in the future. No, he cares for you now. It's not that he cared for you in the past. He's caring for you when? Now. And look at Psalm 55. And this is a verse. Maybe you have never read this. You need to mark this one in your Bible. We're looking at Psalm 55. Psalm 55. We're looking at verse 22. Cast thy burden upon the Lord. And he shall sustain thee. Are you so heavy that God cannot carry you? Are your needs so big that God cannot carry? He carried three million people. How about you? Just give yourself to the Lord. You are a child of God. He saved your soul. Will he neglect your body? He saved your soul. He's preparing a mansion for you in heaven. Will he allow you to live on the street here on earth? No. He's caring for you. And so he says, cast thy body in upon the lord and he shall sustain thee he shall never permit he shall never allow he shall never suffer the righteous to be moved you will not be moved nothing will shake you away from the place the lord has put you and the blessing of the lord will be upon you in jesus name it tells us in luke chapter luke chapter 21 luke chapter 21 verse 34 and take heed to yourselves Lest at any time 
your hearts be overcharged with sufficient and drunkenness and the cares of this life and the cares and the concerns and the worry and the anxiety of this life so that they come upon you unawares, unprepared. We have seen the commandment of the Lord. Now, I want to see the reason why Jesus gave this command that leads us to point number two. Common creatures freedom from worry and anxiety. Common creatures freedom from worry and anxiety. In Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 26 and verse 27. Behold the fowls of the air. The Lord now wants to illustrate the teaching he's given us. He has already told us, don't be anxious. He has taught us, don't be worried. Now he's going to give us the reason why we should never allow any worry, any anxiety. Behold the fowls of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into bands. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Now you need to read that verse properly. Whenever you read, make sure you understand what the Bible is saying, what the verse is saying. I'm going to read it again. Pay attention. And if I, if I use a word which you know is not uh, the right word, then you say no. Are you ready? Behold the fowls of the air. For they sow not. Now do they read? Nor gather into bands. Yet their heavenly father feedeth them. Their heavenly father? No, he is not their father. He is our father. You know what he's saying? He's saying that uh, they are just beasts, animals, worthless creatures, insignificant scripture, like creatures. If all the birds in the sky, if they fall down and die, the world will see continue. If all the dogs, if they fall down and die, the world will see continue. And yet, those insignificant creatures, God takes care of them. Are we not more significant than they? We are the children of God. He is our Heavenly Father. And His Heavenly Father is taking care of those useless, worthless, insignificant creatures. Why do we think he's going to abandon us? It's like, you know, I get to somebody's uh, house and this person owns, po owns poultry and he has a lot of chicks or chicken and then he has some dogs and some pigs and then I see that he feeds them very well. Then I will say, well, if this man can feed the fowls and the chickens like this, I have no doubt he will feed his own children very well. Or do you think a man who is reasonable will feed all those uh, animals and then his child will start to death? No. If God can take care of the fowls in heaven, of the animals that are worthless and insignificant, and is feeding them, how much more your father who is in heaven, he will feed you. He will take care of you. And you know, sometimes I look at these birds and even when we're having our service here, uh, they fly around as if uh, they don't worry. Are they worried? And then sometimes all of us were here and then you see those uh, birds, they just fly like this and fly like this. And then when they want to sing, they sing. And whether we like their song or not, even when we sing that they're disturbing us, they just carry on singing. They don't mind what you think or what I think. If those birds are like that and they're free from care and they're free from anxiety and then they're not talking to one another, they're to they not talking to one another saying, how are we going to get breakfast tomorrow? How will this happen tomorrow? They just know. They just know. What, when tomorrow comes, our food will come. Now, if these birds are like that, why me? I can reach. I can pray. I can think. And I can see all the miracles the Lord has done. If all these birds are not worried, why am I worried? Why are you worried? I said, why are you worried? There's no reason for you to worry. It will take care of us. That's what Jesus was illustrating to them. Anytime you see all those birds in the sky. And you see that they live without worry. They live without anxiety. Then you tell yourself, I have no reason to be worried. I have no reason to be anxious. He tells us in chapter 6. 
at the end, are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? And let's see, for example, Genesis chapter 1. Do you know that when God created this universe, the earth, he made provision for the birds? God is very thoughtful. He does not leave anything unplanned. A plant for the birds. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 30. And to every beast of the earth. And to every fowl of the air. And to every sin that creepeth upon the earth. Wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. He made provision for the birds from the time of creation. Look at Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. And we're reading from verse 41. Job 38 verse 41. Who provides for the raven is food. He provided for the raven is food. And when his young ones cry unto God, they wonder for lack of meat. They wonder about and then he provides for them. If we'll provide for the ravens, how much more will he provide for you? I'm saying he will provide for you. And from tonight, don't allow any worry, any anxiety. Every time you just look around and you see God is providing for all these uh, animals, the Lord will provide for you. And uh, you know what I've discovered? It is uh, the animals who keep at home. Those are the ones that starve. But if you go to the bush where all those animals in the bush, they don't have any human owner. They just go about. They don't starve. They don't starve. Only the ones that will keep at home, they are the ones that starve. The ones that starve. And the ones you have to take care of this way and that way. When God is taking care, there is, there is no failure at all. And if you will hand over yourself to the Lord completely, there is not going to be any failure. In, in Psalm 104, Psalm 104, reading from verse 10. He sendeth the springs into the valleys, which run along the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. And the wild has his quench their thirst. That's how God is taking care of them. And then in verse 12, by them shall the fowls of heaven have their habitation. Which sing among the branches, he watereth the hills from his chambers, and the, the earth is satisfied with the fruit of, of thy works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle, and they have for the service of man, for he that he may bring forth food out of the earth. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, these which all upon thee that thou mayest give them their meat in due season that thou that thou givest them they gather thou openest thine hand they are filled with good and yet the lord is saying he's taking care of all those animals all the birds how much more will he take care of us now you know what worry and anxiety does worry and anxiety makes us to just take all our ideas, all our situation into our hands. And then we do some things that hurt ourselves. That destroy us. Let me show you an example of what I mean. When you have problems and then the Lord is saying, don't worry. And then you worry. Don't be anxious. And then you are anxious. Take no thought. And then you are taking thought. And you think God may be late or God may forget. But God will not forget you. And when you think God will forget, see the, see the things we do. And we hurt ourselves. I want you to look at uh, Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. I'm reading from verse 46. You remember what the Lord said? Take no thought for your life. Take no thought. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried for your life. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Well, with that shall we be clothed? Because it says your heavenly father takes care of you. Let's look at this in Genesis chapter 27 verse 46. In verse 46 it says, And Rachel said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life 
Dumi, worry and anxiety. Let me give you the background. Actually, what happened is when Rebecca was pregnant and she was having some problem carrying the pregnancy, she went to God in prayer. And as she went to God in prayer, the Lord said, don't worry, you're going to bear twins. The older one will be Esau and the younger one will be Jacob. But I'm telling you now, I've seen their future. The younger one, Jacob, will be much blessed above Esau, the firstborn. And then Rebekah held that. Those children were born. And now the children began to grow up. And then Isaac himself, worry and anxiety. He said, I'm getting old. Therefore, Esau, come, go to the field. And go and uh, catch uh, whatever you can hunt. And then make me some food. So that my soul will be so before I die. I seek did not die. Even for the next 20 years. Because you see Jacob went out. Seven years he spent for Leah. Seven years for Rachel. And six years he served Laban. 20 years. When he came back. Uh, I seek was still alive. But the worry and the anxiety. I don't know when I will die. Why are you worried about that? Don't worry about your life. Everything is in the hand of God. And now when I seek said, go and bring me something to eat, then I will bless you. Then Rebecca remembered that Jacob shall have the blessing that it is not Esau. And therefore she quickly did something. That's worry. That's anxiety. Rebecca did not have to do that. And then eventually after they did what they did, then I seek bless uh, Jacob. Esau came and said, my father, bless me. Where are you coming from? Who is the one that gave me venison? And I ate. And then he realized it's Jacob. And now another problem arose. The problem is that he so threatened, I will kill Jacob. Again, Rebecca went to worry and anxiety. And so she went to seek the father of Esau and Jacob and said, What good will my life do me? Leave it in the hands of God. He careth for you. Since God has said that this Jacob will become great, how can he allow you so to kill him? The promise is there already. Rely on the promise of God. And eventually, he, she convinced uh, Isaac and then they sent away Jacob. Before Jacob came back, the mother had died. You see, that's worry and anxiety. We don't have to touch any of these things. Let God work everything out. And eventually now, at last, when he came back, the mother was not there and Isaac was still alive. And Rebekah said, go just for a few days until the anger of Esau will cool down. 20 years, the anger of Esau did not cool down. And then, what did Jacob do? I said, what did Jacob do? He prayed. He could have prayed before he ran away. You don't need to run away. Just stay there and pray. After 20, it took him 20 years to learn that we cast all our cares upon the Lord. He could have prayed without running away. And then he will enjoy the fellowship of the mother and of the father and of the brother Esau. And what God did 20 years after, he could have done at the time he ran away. Worry and anxiety will not help us. You will not worry again. Look at Ruth. The result of worry and anxiety. Ruth chapter 1. In Ruth chapter 1, we're reading from verse 1. Ruth chapter 1. Verse 1, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Why? What an anxiety there is famine. What are we going to eat? My brother, the other people too that are not running away, what are they going to eat? Don't you think about that? The famine is not only on you. The problem is not only on you. All the other people too, they are the same problem. If they are staying, why don't you stay? But this man of Belem Judah, he just ran away because of, the, because of the famine. No prayer. No seeking the face of the Lord. That's what worry and anxiety does in verse 2. And the name of the man was Elimelech. And the name of his wife Naomi. And the name of his two sons Malon and Chilion. If a fratite of the of Bethlehem Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. 
And then we're told in verse 7, Elimelech, Naomi's husband died. You will not die in a strange land. And you know that that's what kills the people, worry and anxiety. You know about the people that remain at home. They went through the famine. They went through the difficulty. Whatever time we're going through, you will go through. Nothing will destroy your life. But it's when anxiety comes, when worry comes, then we take a decision. And then we uproot ourselves. And then we go where the Lord has not sent us. And then we're told, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. And the name of the one was Opa. And the name of the other rules. And they dwelt there about 10 years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. Why did you stay at home, Elimelech? Then you preserve your life. And these innocent children, you preserve their lives. But you know, running elder skelter. Because of worry, because of anxiety. What are we going to eat? Well, with that, shall we be closed? There is famine. There is no job. There is no sustenance. Let me take care of myself. Cast all your cares upon him. And then in verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Oh, she said, we ran away because there was no food. Now we're hearing information. The place we ran away from, God has provided food there. If you remain in the kingdom, Every good thing you need will come to you there. But you know, before she learned the lesson, husband gone, two sons gone, and then one uh, a daughter-in-law, Opa, also stayed behind, and she came back with just one daughter-in-law. And then look at verse 20, verse 20, and she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, call me bitterness, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me that's because of worry and because of anxiety let's remember that we're to cast our cares all upon the lord if we cast our cares upon the lord is caring for the birds he will care for us and then we're looking at matthew chapter 10 matthew chapter 10 we're looking at verse 29 matthew chapter 10 verse 29 and not two sparrows sold for a farthing and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Without the knowledge and the consent of your father. But the very ears of your head are all numbered. Do you know the number? I said, you know the number? No, but God knows the number. And he says, he'll not even allow, no enemy will be able to pluck even a strain of air from you. If that is so, if the worthless air, God is taking care of and he has counted them. And he said, none shall fall to the ground without his consent. I about your very life, your soul, your body, your mind, your job, your wife, your husband, your children. God will take care of everyone. That's why he's telling us then, but your very ears, the very ears of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore ye are of more value than many sparrows. We come to point number three now. Point number three, consistent confidence of faith without anxiety. Confidence in the Lord without fear, without anxiety, without worry. Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 28. And why take his thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not a rich, was not closed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so close the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven. Shall he not much more close you, O ye of little faith? Worry is essentially distrust of God. When somebody is worried, anxious, it's like he's not believing in God. He believes in God for salvation. But for the other little, little things in life, he's doubting God. 
is distrusting God. Faith in God sets us free from worry and anxiety. When you have faith in God, and you know that God will take care of you, and he will take care of you. If God fails, you'll be the first person out of many, many people, millions of people, over many thousands of years, you'll be the first person that God will fail in his case. If God has not failed, all the people that live before you and all the people who are living today, will God fail you? He will not fail you. He will take care of you. And so when people have doubt, unbelief, that's when they get into worry, into anxiety. He who believes in God will not worry. He who believes in God will not be anxious because he believes in the love of God. It is pointless to worry. Can worry and anxiety add one cubit to our stature? You are worrying. By worrying, you become taller. By worrying, do you live longer? No, by worrying, you live, uh, uh, you cut your life short. Uh, people who worry a lot, they die prematurely. People who worry a lot, they get into problems that they shouldn't have gotten into. That's what it says in, in this Matthew chapter 6. Look at it, Matthew chapter 6, verse 27. Which of you, by taking thought, by worrying, by being anxious, can add one cubit to your stature? Uh, can we find a man in the Bible that added more than one cubit to his stature? Can we find a man in the Bible that added more than one year to his lifespan? Yes, we can. Look at 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20. We're reading from verse 1. In those days was Ezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, uh, the prophet son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Now if the man started worrying, if the man started being anxious and started troubling himself, cannot sleep, he will still die. Because by worry and anxiety, you cannot add one cubit to your stature. But instead of having worry and anxiety, he had faith. And he prayed, if you can pray, this situation will change. All these circumstances will change. Prayer will do something that worry cannot do. That anxiety cannot do. It is prayer, it is faith that adds more than one cubit to our stature. And then he turned his face to the wall and he prayed unto the Lord saying, I beseech thee, O, o, o Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. And then he says, and I have done that which is good in thy sight. And Ezekiel wept so, and it came to pass afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again, and tell Ezekiah, the captain of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayers. I have heard thy prayer. Do you know tonight God has heard your prayer? All those concerns, all those cares, all the things you are bothered about. God says, uh, uh, the, the Spirit of God is telling you, God has answered your prayer. Don't worry, just pray. Don't be anxious, just pray. Do you, uh, you know, some of our singers, they tell us, why worry when you can pray? You know, some other people, it is why pray when you can worry. But I will not worry. I said I will not worry. If we can pray, look at a man like you, like me. He prayed and God added something to his life. God will add value to your life. I've heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. That sickness will not kill you. It's not time for you to die yet. If you can pray and believe in the Lord and stop the worry and anxiety, all those problems, they will not drown your life. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days. How many years? Fifteen years. By worrying, nothing will be added. By prayer, fifteen years were added unto this man. And that's what the Lord is telling us. And now you see the people that worry, they get into extra problems. Great, great problems. Let me show you an example. For Samuel chapter 27. 
First Samuel chapter 27. I'm reading from verse 1. Worry and anxiety instead of prayer. Worry and anxiety instead of leaning upon the Lord. Worry and anxiety instead of just saying, Lord, I'm in your hand. In First Samuel chapter 27 verse 1, David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. It is surprising David could talk like that because David had been anointed. He had been anointed king. Samuel said, you'll be king over the land of Israel. Jonathan said, I know you'll be king over Israel. And Saul also said, I know you will surely reign over Israel. Swear unto me that when you become a king, that you will not destroy my family. Samuel said so. Saul said so. And Jonathan said so. And he himself knew. In fact, the whole of Israel, they knew. That's what Abigail said. Abigail said, be careful, David. I know this man, Nabal, his name is a foolishness. And he has acting like his name. Don't do anything to him. So that when you become a king, everybody knew that David was going to become a king. The angels know the blessings on you. Almighty God knows what he has purposed for you. Jesus knows what he has ordained for you. And the Holy Ghost is bearing witness as to what you are going to become in life. But at the time of a problem, then we forget what the Father has said. We we'll forget what Jesus has said. We we'll forget what the Holy Ghost has said. We we'll forget even some of our brothers and sisters. The testimonies they gave about us. And what the Lord revealed to them. That God is going to bless your life. David forgot everything. That he had been anointed king. And he was going to reign. Now he said. One day. I will perish. Just die. Out of the hand of Saul. Then in verse 1, there is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. This chapter 27, in chapter 17, 10, 10 chapters behind, is when he fought against Goliath, a Philistine. And now he went into the enemy camp because of discouragement. Because of worry, because of anxiety. You know, anxiety and worry will just drive us here and there instead of being the king or the prince that you are and a child of a king that you are and just staying confidently knowing God will take care of your life. But now he went to the land of the Philistines and Saul shall despair of me and seek and to seek me anymore in any coast of Israel. So I shall escape out of his son. And David arose and he passed over with 600 men that were with him unto Achish, the son of Melk, Melk, the king of Gath. And I'm surprised none of those 600 men could talk to David to say, David, we know you are a leader. We know you are a king. Don't let us allow temporary problem to take us away from long, long life and lifelong promise of God. We are following you because we know God has appointed you to be a leader. How are we going to run to the enemy camp saying that we are afraid of anybody? In fact, I don't know why David should do something like this. And sometimes I don't know why you should do something like that. When the protection of God is upon you. There was a time that Saul was looking for David. And there was a mountain. If you read in 1 Samuel, David was on this side and Saul was on this side. Just a few minutes, say, Saul would have caught David. And then immediately God sent a messenger from the house of a Saul saying, there's a problem. So come, come, come. And then that's how Saul went away and he went to face problem and left David alone. God had been protecting David. And God will still protect David. God has been protecting you. And God will still protect you. He has been providing for you. He will still provide for you. Why take this kind of step? Because of worry, because of anxiety. Today, anxiety is cancelled. And then eventually, here is what happened now. And let us look at, uh, you know, this, uh, David, the step that followed, verse 5. And David said unto Achish, if I have not found grace in thine eyes. David, I don't understand your language. Grace in the sight of a Philistine. Grace in the sight of the enemy of God. Let, let them give me a place in some town, in, in a country, that I may dwell there. For why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? He dropped his crown. 
He said, you are a greater man than I am. You are a greater king that I am, than I am. I'm just an ordinary fellow. He lost his dignity, worry and anxiety. He said, why should I dwell and live in a royal city with you? Then Akish gave him Siglak that day. Uh, where, wherefore, Siglak pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. Well, if you remember the story of Siglag, those people came there and they just burnt everything down. And then David began to cry. And look at it in chapter 30. Chapter 30, it's um, uh, from verse 1. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Siglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Siglag and, uh, and, and, and Siglag and smitten Siglag and burnt it with fire. And then we're told, uh, here in verse, uh, uh, look at verse 4, Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. David, you know, there is sin, worry, and anxiety. It's worry and anxiety that drove him and drove them out of the place of protection. If we stay under the shadow of the Almighty, nothing will harm us. We don't have to run to the Philistines or to Achish or to anybody. Where we are, the Lord will take care of us. That's why the Lord is telling us, don't be worried and don't be anxious. The Lord will take care. Let's look at Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Don't let us be running about, going here and going there. When the Lord has promised that he'll take care of us. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. That's where I'm living. I said that's where I'm living. In the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He is my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely, He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. And from the noisome pestilence, He shall cover thee with His feathers. Under His wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid. Of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that fly by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand. It shall not come near thee. You are protected. Your life is preserved. And God will preserve even the whole of your family in Jesus' name. Only with thine eyes thou shalt behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee. All the wrong imagination, all the negative imagination in your mind, cast them away. There's nothing like that. All those things, bad dreams that the devil is trying to show you some negative picture. Erase them from your mind. That thing cannot happen. Because only with thine eyes thou shalt be old and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, even my refuge which is the most high your habitation. There shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. You know, even if it's HIV AIDS, God will take it away. And you know, sometimes I'm surprised that even those who are not Christians, they come and uh, you know with tears they say i'm having hiv aids and you know i will pray and god heals them even those who are meeting me for the first time we just pray like this and hiv aids is gone i about you a real child of god if the devil has brought it upon you we don't know where it's coming from it will throw it back to where it's coming from <laughs> hey, you know i we went for a crusade in february at Ibano. And uh, then after the, you know, on Sunday there, I went to worship with those uh, wonderful people. And then I had a little time to counsel. And I told them, you know, the brother there, beloved brother, the overseer pastor there. And I said, now nah, I'm closing because I need to prepare for the night. And he understood. And then uh, when I, I closed, there was this uh, lady. And she's been, you know, coming to the church and, you know, a beloved sister. But we don't know what happened. She had HIV AIDS. But the members of the church did not know. The coordinator did not know. And our leaders there did not know. And then she, she went to the pastor there and said, I need to see the GS. And the pastor said, please. And the GS, uh, once he gives instruction, I don't want to go uh, contrary to that instruction. He, he said, it's closing now because of the evening meeting. 
And that lady began to cry, began to cry. Our church secretary here in Lagos, he, he was there. When the church secretary here, when he, she saw that a lady, the way the lady was crying, then the church said, brother, please, please, just uh, go show this uh, lady to the pastor. And uh, so then eventually the pastor came in and said, sir, I'm sorry. I said, what are you sorry about? You said you are closing, but you know this lady? I said, okay, let her come in. And then she came in, and then the overseer went out, and she said, sir, I'm about to get married. And then they told us to go and do tests. Everything is set to accept this. Then they told me, I have HIV AIDS. What am I going to do? And then she, she started the tears again. I said, oh, I said, in the name of Jesus, HIV AIDS, get out of that place. Praise the Lord. And then she has said that, so you didn't take us one minute and tonight your problems are gone. And uh, so eventually, during the week after we finished uh, the crusade, I came back to Lagos. Then she went to the hospital, to the same place she was tested before. And said, I came for another test. And the matron there looked at her and said, eh, oh, why do you want another test? Anyway, okay, come on here. And then they tested her. When the matron looked at the result, it said, anointing pass anointing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And you know, and God is doing that everywhere. And you beloved people, your time has come. Yeah. All those things that came upon your life, everything will vanish away in Jesus' name. We are the children of God. There is nothing to fear. There's nothing to be worried about. And there's no anxiety. Don't, don't, don't stand up yet. Let me finish. Psalm 91 is beautiful. I said Psalm 91 is beautiful. You need this psalm. Anywhere you go, just go with this. There's security in your life in Jesus' name. And then it says, it says in verse, in verse 11, it says, For he shall give his angels charge over thee, your bodyguard around you. To keep thee in all thy ways, they shall bear thee up in their hands. Lest thou dash thy foot against a stone, thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample on the feet, because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high. Because he has known my name, he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. Will God answer your prayer? He has answered already. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. Will I satisfy him and show him my salvation? Throw your worry and anxiety to the wind. God is taking care of you. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord. We know that there's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to be anxious about. Just be a child of God. A child of God. A child of the heavenly king. And you're saying, oh Lord, here am I. Here am I. I belong to you from today. If you are not born again, you just surrender your life to the Lord. And say, Lord, I belong to you. Lord, I belong to you. There's nothing for you to fear again. Surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. God is a merciful father. He's a loving father. He's a compassionate father. If you have sinned, they will forgive you. If you are backsliding, they will restore you. He's saying, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. He that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. He will never cast you away. He will not push you away. Come. Come to the Lord. Just say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done that is wrong. I surrender my heart, my soul, my life unto you. From tonight, you are my father. I am your child. From tonight, Jesus, you are my savior. You are my Lord. I give myself. I surrender myself unto you. Surrender yourself to the Lord. Very simple. I accept you, Lord, as my Savior. Whatever I have done that makes you unhappy with me, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. And immediately His forgiveness will come. And the Spirit of God will bear witness in your heart that you are now a child of God. A child of God. 
a child of God. And now you abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And there's nothing for you to fear anymore. Even the very air on your head, everything is numbered. And nothing will fall to the ground without his knowledge. Accept Christ as your savior. He will not say no. Jesus, you are my savior. He will not say no. Jesus, you are my Lord. He will not say no. Jesus, I accept your sacrifice on the cross of Calvary for me. He will not say no. He accepts everyone that comes to him. He forgives everyone that turns away from sin. To say, Lord, here am I. I belong to you from tonight. If you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, thou shalt be saved. For what the heart man believes unto righteousness. And with your mouth confession is made unto that salvation. Jesus is my savior. Yes, yes, heaven will confirm it. Jesus is my redeemer. Yes, yes, heaven will confirm it. Jesus is now my Lord, the controller of my life. Yes, yes, heaven will confirm it. Come unto me, come unto me, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest in your soul, peace in your mind. In your relationship with the Lord, there's reconciliation. And you're not afraid of eternal judgment anymore. Your heavenly Father careth for you. Your heavenly Father cares for you. Cast all your cares upon him. Don't allow worry and anxiety to ruin your life. Don't allow worry and anxiety to uproot you from the place the Lord has planted you. Don't allow worry and anxiety to take you away from the place of security. To take you away from the place of protection. Say, Lord, now I rest in the bosom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, now I rest in the bosom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Accept the protection. He's your redeemer. He's your refuge. He's your protection. On his wings you can stay. As you believe that he is your savior, he accepts you into the family of God. God has never failed anyone. And he cannot fail you. And he will not fail you. He accepts everyone that comes to put their trust in the Lord. Just say, Lord, thank you. Here I am. Lord, I thank you. Your sins forgiven. Your yokes broken. Your sicknesses healed. Now you're a child of the king, a child of the heavenly father, a child of the heavenly father. Once you accept the promise of God as true, nothing can beat you out of it. Once you accept the promise of the Lord as real and you take hold of that promise personally, this is mine. 
then it's real, then it's true. And the devil cannot contradict it. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, whosoever, no matter how far you have gone in sin, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, I come. Lord, I come. Lord, I come. I am saved. Heaven, comes, heaven confirms it. And the Spirit of God will be a witness in your heart that you are saved. That you are a child of God. A new life will begin. And then the protection of the Lord, the security of the Lord, the umbrella of the Lord will be upon you every time. And it will give his angels charge over you. To keep you in all your ways. Then he says he'll bless you with long life. He feeds the birds of the air. He takes care of even the lilies of the field. And he says, will he not take care of you? All you need is a faith in God. And the protection is there. A faith in God. And the preservation is there. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. And accepts you. Like you accept Christ. As your Lord and Savior. And then you tell the Lord. Hold my hand. Keep me strong. Keep me strong. So that I, not, I will not yield to temptation. And when the tempter knocks at the door, remember what that girl said? I will say, Jesus, my Savior, go and answer the tempter at the door. And Jesus will knock off the power of that tempter. Rest in the Lord and trust in the Lord. It's yours, he'll never fail. It's yours, he'll never be conquered. You don't have to do like David. To run to the camp of the Philistines. To run to the city of the Philistines. To run to the enemy camp. You can stand, you can stay. Very firm, solidly. On the rock of ages. And stay in the protection of the blood of the Lamb. Trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord. And promise the Lord that you are not going to stray away to the enemy camp anymore. The blessing of the Lord is upon your life. David forgot that the anointing of the Lord from Samuel was upon his life. David forgot. That even Jonathan testified, you will reign. David forgot. That even Saul testified. You will reign. It was because he forgot anxiety and worry took over his life. Don't forget the calling of God upon your life. The anointing of the Lord upon your life. The protection of the Lord over your life. Don't forget. And if you will stand solidly. And you are stable and steadfast. Unmovable. You are not moved away by what you see. By what you hear. And you depend upon the Lord. Then there will be stability in your experience. And the Lord himself will take care of you. He will take care of you. Make a covenant with the Lord that will not be changed. A covenant that will not be altered. When trials come. When temptations come. When difficulties come. When challenges come. That you'll be able to stand. Immovable. Stand. In the waves and the storms of life. Knowing the promise of the Lord. Knowing the protection of the Lord. 
upon your life. And you will not allow worry and anxiety shifting you about, making you run helter skelter, but staying in the hollow of the hand of the Almighty God. And then you know the promises that will never, never fail. You know the security that Satan can never destroy. Don't worry about your child. That child is in the hand of the Almighty God. Don't worry about that daughter. That daughter is in the hands of the Almighty God. About your marriage, don't worry about it. The Lord will give you the best He has provided for you. About your job, leave it in the hands of the Almighty God. Everything is secured, it's there available for you. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought. What shall we drink? What shall we eat? Well, with that shall we be closed. For your father careth for you. Your father careth for you. Make sure he's your father. Your heavenly father. Greater and higher than all the earthly fathers. He cares for you. Are you sick? He will heal you. Any plague? He will cancel that plague. Affliction, attack. He will take it away. You have a father who is thinking about you. A father is providing for you all your needs. A father will not forsake or forget his own. A father who says, leave all the problems in my hand. I'll take care of them. Leave all the challenges in my hand. I'll take care of them. And you can leave everything in the hands of the almighty God. He'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. Yes, God will take care of you. Throughout the way, all the way, all the days. Yes, he'll take care of you. God will take care of you. He cannot forget you. All the big problems, cast them unto the Lord. And the small, small problems to you, cast them unto the Lord. Casting all your cares upon the Lord, for he careth for you. Casting all your cares. Casting all your cares. Casting all your cares on him. Because he careth for you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Hand over all the problems into his hand. And let him solve the Give God a chance. Give God a chance to bear all your bodies and to carry all the cares away from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight is a night of glory. A night of joy. A night of freedom from worry and anxiety. All the things that oppress your mind from today, everything is taken away. 
heads bowed and eyes closed. You see, all these promises are for the children of God. And if there's anybody there, your heart is, you know, kind of worrying you and asking question, are you really a child of God? And let's throw that question away now. Because you see, the Lord forgives. And whatever sin anyone has committed, you know, God will forgive everything. Because the Bible says, whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And tonight, anyone there has bowed and eyes closed. And all the locations where we are, you are coming to know the Lord. Or you have gone away from the Lord and you now say, I'm coming back home. The Lord is receiving you right now. I said it's about and eyes are closed. Just raise up your hand and pray for those people. The Lord himself will forgive your sin. God bless you there. God bless you there. Just raise up the hand. I want to say the hand raised it up very well. So I, God bless you. Thank you very much. Any other hand? Doubt in your heart. Doubt in your mind. And you want to be sure tonight. You are a real child of God. Father, in the name of Jesus. All these sons that are raised up here and in all the other locations, so Lord, you have said, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Save them in Jesus' name. Forgive all their sins. Take the condemnation away. Write their names in the book of life in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, the spirit of the living God will be a witness of their eyes that now they are children of God. Confirm it, O oh Lord. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, before we go, how can I release you without taking all that burden away from your heart? All that care away from your life? All those problems away. Before you leave here tonight, all those problems are gone. And in all the satellite locations, anywhere you are tonight, it's a night of freedom. It's a night of healing. It's a night of deliverance. And all the shackles and chains of the enemy, everything is broken tonight in Jesus' name. Just raise up your hand. Father, in the name of Jesus. We come here tonight wanting to be free from anxiety, free from cares, and free from worry. We want to rest in the bosom of Christ. You said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy, and I will give you rest. Learn of me, take my yoke upon you, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. All as we come to you tonight, O oh Lord, give rest to everyone in Jesus' name. Take all the anxieties away, all the cares away, all the worry away, all the problems we have, we put them in your hands. Take the care of them in Jesus' name. Sickness, infirmity, incurable disease, we command you, go away in Jesus' name. All the joblessness, we command you, get away in Jesus' name. Those who are worried about their children, about their wives, about their husbands, about whatever problems in the family, oh Lord, will bring those problems to your hand right now. Take care of them in Jesus' name. Any incurable disease, HIV, AIDS, tonight we conquer you. That HIV, AIDS, I command you, come out from their bodies in Jesus' name. All the attacks, all the affliction, I take authority over you. Set your people free in Jesus' name. Lord, that individual I've been worried about because, you know, some of these uh, people came to your house in the night and see that uh, you were in a shock. And see that time uh, you have been expressing that shock. When it's getting late, you're going to sleep. You remember that kind of thing. And then you begin to panic again. That shock, I take it away from you right now. And all the sweating and the fear that comes upon you whenever you are going to sleep, I command, be free in Jesus' name. And then the kind of, uh, the kind of untimely death coming in that family. And then you see, you know, you're afraid, maybe it's my turn. No, it's not your turn. You will live, you will not die in Jesus' name. 
and all those terrifying dreams that the devil have been kind of uh, showing you some things in the dream. And then during the day, you are worried almost to death. And even somebody there that wanted to commit suicide just about two weeks ago, I canceled that now in Jesus' name. And I pronounce blessing upon every one of you. Life upon every one of you. Provision upon every one of you. And you go out today. You are free in Jesus name. All the enemies that are pursued you until this time. They are sent away from you now. Your life will be a blessing. Progress and promotion in your life. Prosperity upon your life. And the Lord will fulfill all his good promises in your life. In Jesus name. Thank you Lord because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.